So um, I understand um, uh, no Polish whatsoever, and I apologize for that. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking only in English. And I understand you all are perfect at English because the education system here is so good compared to my education system in England. So I hope that's going to be okay. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about me before I talk um, because uh, I think understanding me will help you understand why I'm going to say what I'm going to say. The first is I'm British, although I live in Palo Alto in California, I'm not American. Uh, having I, am, I am an American citizen, but uh, I was born in Britain. I lived in Britain uh, until 1996. I started uh, many companies in England, but only from the age of 40. My first startup, I was 40 years old. It was called EasyNet, which was the first ISP actually in Europe. Um, and before that, I was political activist. Um, actually, Trotskyist. Um, for those of you who are educated, <laughs> uh, I was a Western European opponent of the capitalist state. And uh, I really campaigned on anti-racism, supporting uh, Indian, the Pakistani, Caribbean people in England who were being victimized. And uh, I also fought uh, on, uh, in support of the Irish against the English troops being in Ireland. So I was a political activist. I'm a sociology and political science major. Um, not technology, political science and sociology. And so I learned first about people and only later about technology. And when I was 20, I learned to code uh, because I wanted to do my politics in a, in a modern way. So I learned on a, a computer called a Tandy TRS-80, which was this big computer with eight and a half inch floppy drives. And I learned how to code in BASIC, uh, and during the 1980s, I built a company which still exists today called Clarkswell, which was a database and networking company in England. 1993, I stopped doing that and I built EasyNet, the ISP. And in, in 96, EasyNet did an IPO. And I moved to the United States and did a company called Real Names. And Real Names really was very much to do with my political past. The idea was that the internet was too English. And I created a, a naming system which used the UTF-8 character set to allow web addresses to be in any language, in any character set. Chinese, Korean, in Polish script, in Cyrillic, d it doesn't matter. And Real Names was embraced by Microsoft um, and VeriSign and became a naming layer on the internet between 1996 and 2002. It was very big and was embedded in Internet Explorer. And, you know, the reason I, I did all these things is because I love change. And change is, if you think about it, politics is about change, hopefully for the better. Um, and technology is also about change. In technology, you don't get to choose the conditions under which change is made. The conditions under which change happens is dictated to you. So what my talk is about today is the current conditions for change. So if you're building a startup, or you fund startups, or you work in startups, you know, you don't do that in the abstract. Um, I'm sure this quote will not be very welcome in Poland, but it's worth telling. Karl Marx had a very good quote. He says, human beings make history, but not in conditions of, of their own choice. The conditions are given to them by the world that they're born into. So change is always constrained by context. So today's talk is all about the context right now in, it says Silicon Valley, but this talk really is not just about Silicon Valley. This talk is about everywhere because what is happening in Silicon Valley actually is starting to look very similar to what has always been true in Warsaw or, or, or Krakow. Uh, it's about the climate for change and the context for change. So we can start now. So the first thing is, of course, we live in a time of change. Um, change, in a way, is a constant. Uh, I always think of the world like this. You know, if we draw a circle here and a circle here, and the first circle is the past, and the second circle is the future, the present is always where they overlap. And the present is always a fight between the past, which is trying to survive, and the future, which is trying to be born. 
And the skill for an engineer or an investor or a startup founder is to figure out which is dying and which is being born and to focus on the thing which is being born because that is the thing which can bring uh, the future. So we always live at a time of change. So in a way, it's a useless thing to say. The real question is, what is the change? What kind of change? And um, I'm going to use a few slides today from Mary Meeker, who two weeks ago presented the, the, the state of the internet at a conference in, uh, in San Francisco. This is one of her slides. And this slide shows that um, all of us in this room are really no longer using laptops or desktops very much. We're all using these things. But about two-thirds of the phone users in the world do not yet have one of these. One-third does, two-thirds does not. Even though only one-third have smartphones, smartphone use has dictated software development now for the past two or three years. Very few new companies are building websites anymore. Certainly not successful companies. Most successful companies are mobile first, and many of them are mobile only, not even mobile first. And that's because of the, the adoption of smartphones. That's, if you like, the context. Tablets are growing even faster. This is since the introduction of the iPad. And it compares to the growth rate of desktops and notebooks. And you can see that the velocity of adoption is dramatically faster than any previous platform. Even though the absolute numbers are still quite small, the growth rate is very, very, very high. But it's still only the beginning. This is the number of tablets compared to the number of TV users. 5.58 billion TV watchers in the world, less than half a billion tablet users, smartphone about 1.6 billion, mobile phone 5 billion. So even though the change is fast and dramatic, it's only the beginning. It's only the very start of the change. Um, and the change already dominates the software we write. So in the future, it will only do that more. This shows the implication for web use. The blue bars uh, is, is this year's percentage of web use in the world, which derives from smartphones. The green is how, what percentage of web use last year derived from smartphones. So already in Asia and Africa, close to 40% of all web use is driven by smartphones. North America, nearly 20% almost double last year. Uh, here in Europe, 16%, exactly double last year. So the rate of growth, even of web use, and let's face it, how often do we use a browser on our smartphone? Not very often. We're using apps a lot. Um, but even though we don't use a browser so much on our phone, the, the use, the percentage of the web by smartphones is, is eating into the use from desktops and from laptops. So if you're a software developer, and somebody asks you the question, should you build your software for the web or should you build your software for mobile? It doesn't seem very sensible to build for the web. It seems most sensible to build for mobile. This is measuring media consumption by device. And if you notice, everything is declining. The, the consumption of media on TV, declining. Online, flat. Radio, declining. Print, declining. Other, I don't know what that is, but mobile, growing. So that mainly means video, watching video. Uh, and certainly in the, in the US now, channels are becoming apps. I have an ESPN app that I can watch sport on. It's both on my smartphone and on my Apple TV and on my Roco box. Uh, I have an HBO app that I can watch movies on. So now the channel is separate from the cable network or the satellite network. It's now an app, and it lives independently of those networks as well as still being within those networks. And the consumption numbers is, is growing because of it. And then lastly, uh, every time we've seen platform change from mainframe to mini computer, mini computer to PC, PC to internet, internet to mobile, 
the number of users has multiplied by about 10 times. There were about 1 billion desktop internet users in 2000. This projects there'll be 10 billion mobile internet users. 10 billion. And now with the emergence of sensors, like the iBeacon that Estimote from uh, Krakow is, is doing, uh, probably the number of connected devices gets to way, way more than 100 billion uh, over the next 10, 15 years. So th basically the, the context in which we exist is changing and we as developers or investors or as startup founders have to respond. The simple truth is this guy will probably never use a laptop. And absolutely huge, massive new companies are being built as this change happens. Uber, $19 billion valuation. $19 billion because it wants to own the concept of a taxi from a phone that can tell you where the cab is right now and how long it will take to get to you and what it will cost for you to take it. Beats Music, only 100,000 users. $3 billion to Apple last week because it curated music for a smart device. Until two weeks ago, I didn't use Beats Music. I used iTunes. I downloaded Beats Music. I told it my taste. Within two weeks, I now only use Beats Music because it's so good at delivering music to me based on what it is that I like. Uh, it's way, way better than iTunes ever was. And it's simply using a smart device, the cloud, and, and human curation to, to service me. Uh, How's? Uh, three, $2.3 billion valuation. It's, my wife used this app when we designed our house. It's for interior design and decorations and furniture, and it's a way to collect. Completely transformed uh, things, and it's massive. WhatsApp, $17 billion, just a chat app. There's been chat apps for 20 years. Remember ICQ? Um, but because smartphones came about, you can reinvent something that previously existed, but in a new fo form, and become relevant again. And WhatsApp did a great job of doing that. WeChat is the same. We don't know how much it's worth, but it's worth billions of dollars. It's the Chinese equivalent of WeChat. And Snapchat, very similar, billions of dollars. And this is just the beginning. This is not even past the first 10% of the change which will happen because of the world that we live in today. Uh, this, is, this is adding a new dimension to smartphones. And the new dimension is in this corner here. Uh, we already have the cloud. We already have smartphones. What happens when the cloud and smartphones get put together with sensors in, in real places that tell the smartphone about the place? and where the cloud can contain data, and the phone, in a way, becomes um, a gateway between the real world and, uh, and the cloud. Uh, that leads to, uh, put, just for example, in this building today, if all of our phones were sensors and the cloud had our business cards, we could all get business cards on our phones without meeting each other. And when we met, we could see who each other was that wouldn't have been possible, and really isn't possible, without sensors. The, the attempts to do things like that before, like bump, involved physical decisions being made between people. So the world of sensors and the cloud and smartphones e expands what we're already seeing massively and, and creates lots of new software. It, it also does what, this is a Mary Meeker slide, um, it also creates the need for app services. She makes the point here, apps are beginning to disappear altogether. She really doesn't mean disappear. What she means is that apps are beginning to provide services to other apps. In the same way that we went from the web as a portal to web services during Web 2.0, now we're moving from apps for consumers to apps services a services layer. Companies like Pass, Lair, which is a messaging service. Um, uh, I'm doing a company called Chat Center, which is in this space. Uh, the, these are uh, uh, 
urban airship, which is a notification and alert service. This is especially important in a world where there is Android and iOS, and they don't really agree with each other. You need a unifying layer on top that allows apps to perform across these platforms. That is beginning to happen. And sensors and the data related to sensors is part of that layer, the layer that doesn't really belong in an app but belongs in the cloud supporting applications. Huge new development. Uh, that means we can reimagine how people meet. You know, you could go to a bar now and broadcast your presence and your marital state, for example, and your openness to meeting people. Uh, and people in the bar could know that that's your, your condition, and the technology would already allow that, now that we have uh, eye beacons and sensors. Uh, you can reimagine uh, all kinds of local services. We could walk down the street in Krakow and literally know if there's a room for rent without knocking on the door. Um, so we can bring data into time and space in a way that we couldn't because now the phone can locate where you are, who you are, and what time of day it is, and can look in the cloud and ask what data is, av is available for this. In the past, GPS could do that. With sensors, you can bring it right down to a single house in a single street and, and know. Grocery shopping. The biggest new app in California is called DoorDash. Basically, the way DoorDash works is like Uber for food. Um, you say, oh, I, I really need the following food. It could be fresh groceries or it could be a cooked meal from a restaurant. Literally, they go buy it for you. They tell you when they place the order. They tell you when they pick the food up. They tell you when the driver is leaving to come to you. And they tell you when the driver is two minutes away. So nobody's going shopping anymore. Everybody's using DoorDash to get things delivered at home. Um, music we've already talked about. Uh, the number of streams versus owned music. I, I don't know about you guys, but I have vinyl, I have CDs, I have even some tapes. They're now in my storage box in a garage. I never use them anymore. I'm, I ha all those songs that I bought are now available for $10 a month on a streaming service, plus every other song ever produced. So music consumption is changing because of this. Even money is changing. And um, now with, this is Estimote. Anyone from Estimote here, by the way? I'd love to meet you guys afterwards and talk about this, but um, there, there's now um, you know, even, a, even a new change. So given all of that, and think in terms of opportunity, the, the amount of opportunity to reinvent the future and to create companies valued in the billions of dollars by choosing the right idea and doing it on a big scale is enormous. So you would think that there'd be lots of venture capital available for companies, right? Wrong. Absolutely not true. And the mythology which says that Silicon Valley is a river of gold is, is really mythology. It really isn't, isn't true. The valley today actually looks like this. And I, as you can see, I'm a great artist. Uh, this was a sketch I did on my iPad using one of those pens and my finger. So uh, I apologize for how bad this is. But it tells a story. Uh, the valley today, and, and this is true, I guarantee this is true here in Krakow and, and Warsaw. It's true in Berlin. It's true in London. But it's, it didn't used to be true in Silicon Valley. It is now. There's really two ways to, to, to raise money for companies. The first is to join an incubator or an accelerator. Y Combinator, the most well-known valley accelerator, the current uh, crop, they call them a crop of companies, is 90, 90. 90 companies will be part of the Y Combinator accelerator program that starts in a couple of months' time. Um, 500 startups, uh, similar number of companies. Uh, there are literally hundreds of companies every three months that join an accelerator or an incubator. And they typically will get roughly $100,000, and they will have to build something with that $100,000. They then will have to graduate to get a Series A, and a Series A is, is, everybody talks about the Series A crunch. If they fail, 
then they have two choices. They can be acquired, that's a com combination of two English words, acquired and hired. Acquired means uh, you get a job with Google or Facebook or Yahoo or somebody, and they call it an acquire, but really you're just getting a job. Or they literally will die, go to the bloodbath, and start over again back at the top. And this is the normal life for most startups in Silicon Valley. On the right is what happens if you manage to get what's called traction. If, you, if, if your startup gets traction during the first phase, then you can raise very, very large sums of money, almost unlimited sums of money from growth investors who want to bet on companies where the risk has been taken out of it. So you can join an accelerator or an incubator. Uh, I call it factory farming. Um, now, I should say this is not meant to be detrimental. I, I run an incubator. Um, it's meant to be an indication of how crowded it is and, and, and what the process is. It's like a sausage factory, making sausages. Uh, this is measuring the growth of accelerators. This is coming from Crunchbase, by the way, which is a great resource for data from TechCrunch. Um, 2013 is the first year there's been a decline, and that is a decline in Silicon Valley because, to some extent, the trend has peaked. Uh, and this is breaking it out by region. So the blue all represent different parts of the world, showing that the valley, America has declined, but everywhere else, accelerators are growing. If you get big, and, and that really means really big, you can raise really large sums of money. Things like this. Uber raised $1.2 billion last week at a valuation of $17 billion. $1.2 billion, which is a just an unheard of amount of money to raise in a private financing for a venture capital initiative. But that is what's called growth capital. It's like private equity. It is, it's really where the risk no longer exists and people just want to put their money in because they believe the risk is gone. If you're normal, I mean, you just do okay. You're happy with your progress, but you haven't yet got traction. This is what happens. You basically die because the funding environment doesn't support staged growth. The funding environment only supports experimentation and success. In the middle, where you need to continue experimenting to grow, you will not be able to raise money, any money. It will be very, very hard. They call it the Series A crunch. I don't like that because it isn't just the Series A crunch. It's actually the second, the second round. It could be that you did an A round and you need to do a B. It could be that you did a seed round and you need to do an A. It's whatever the second time you want to raise money. The question is, do you have traction? Do you have traction? And traction um, is, is, is uh, you know, a word that is hard to define, but the answer for most startups is no. We don't have traction, and that is normal. Norm startups don't usually have traction initially. They still need to experiment and to learn. The Series A crunch looks like this, or the Series B crunch. The bottom line is the number of A or B rounds. The top line is the number of seed rounds. And the, you see the gap is widening. And this isn't because there's too many companies. Uh, too many companies is not the cause, it is the symptom. The cause is the concentration of capital focused on incubation, on the one hand, which leads to companies being formed to get that capital, and the concentration of capital in growth, on the other hand. Um, that separation of capital into two groups leads to there being too many companies. It's not that too many companies creates the problem. Uh, the way I think of it is, we startup people are kind of like circus animals. You teach us the rules and you feed us. If we follow the rules, then we will follow the rules. And if the, rule, if the rules are you can get you know, 200,000 zloty for three months, um, then everyone will start a startup with two people to do something to get 200,000 zloty for three months. 
uh, it's it's basically the 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 the, uh, the uh, pot of gold creates the environment that creates the companies. Um, so this is a much more beautiful version of my sketch, uh, <laughs> not. <laughs> Uh, and it shows that traction is the only way to get between the two sides of the valley. The o there is no other way. Now, everything I just described would be, would be perfectly fine if it was just normal you know, survival of the fittest. If it was the case that all these startups should die because they suck and they just fail because the people just are not good enough, the ideas are not good enough, then it would be fine. It wouldn't be wrong. It would be the right thing to happen. But that isn't what's happening here. It is not, it is not natural selection. What's happening is something different. Risk capital, which is another way of saying venture capital, risk capital has abandoned risk. Post, there is, they're not prepared to take risk anymore. They only want to bet on growth, on success. And this happened partly because of uh, uh, Yuri Milner from DST in, in, in uh, Russia. Came to Silicon Valley a few years ago and he invested in Facebook at a valuation of about 10 billion, if my memory serves me right. And everyone said he's crazy. But he wasn't crazy. He made a lot of money from investing late in success. And every Silicon Valley venture capital firm, the well-known brands, Sequoia, Kleiner Perkins, Axel, Benchmark, copied him. They all went and built growth funds. And they largely abandoned the seed stage. That's when the incubators rose up to take advantage of that. And suddenly, there was now two worlds. The growth world, which, which the traditional venture capitalists moved to, and the startup world, which the, was dominated by the incubators, the accelerators, and now crowdsourcing, crowdfunding startups like AngelList. And in the middle, nothing, nothing. Uh, this is the official uh, summary of the venture capital industry in, 2013, in 2012 by Ernst & Young. VC funds are investing fewer dollars at a later stage and on tougher terms than ever before. This second round problem is not temporary. It is not something which will change quickly. It's, it's structural. That means it's baked into the very ecosystem that we live in. This is um, a, a good friend of mine who runs uh, K9 Ventures. He's called Manu Kumar. And Manu uh, tried to address this on his blog. He said, here's how I think about it today. Pre-seed, think about that term for a minute, pre-seed. What, what is that? Is there something before seed? <laughs> well, yes, he says there is. Pre-seed, less than $500,000 is the new seed. And then he said, seed is the new Series A, roughly $2 million, used for building products, establishing a product market fit and revenue. Series A is the new Series B. Six to 15 million used to scale a successful business and get new customers. And Series B is the new Series C. What, what he's done is he's invented multiple stages before you're real. It's, it's like being born now is not just two things, conception and birth. Now there's something before conception, something uh, earlier. And, and so in order to try to explain what's going on, they're creating completely new terms that make, actually make no sense. He's a good friend. This is, this is like gobbledygook. It, I don't know if gobbledygook translates in any way into Polish, but it's nonsensical. It doesn't make any sense. It's in a way justifying something after the fact by trying to describe it. This is a simpler way of saying the same thing. This is a big pile of money, $15,000 to $2 million. This is a big pile of money and there's nothing in the middle. That's basically the truth. So I started by saying that at a time of great change, we should be taking great risks. And I'm going to wrap up now because I think I'm coming to the end of my time. Um, the truth is, if we don't take big risks, we meaning investors, we'll force entrepreneurs to fit into the culture we've created, which is a small culture. It really is all built around this idea, 
Demo Day. Demo Day is a small idea. It's come to my building, I'll give you some money, and three months from now you're going to build something and show investors what you built. This is really a narrow straitjacket for innovation. It doesn't help you address the big things that need to be changed in the world or which potentially could be changed in the world. It makes you do small things. And then what happens in the investors, they look at your small idea and say, it's too small. I can't give you money for that. And then, by definition, you fail because you don't get any more money. So we, the investors, are creating this inevitability. That means there's a big opportunity here. If, if this room was full of rich people, I'd be making a different speech. I'd be saying, you should give me your $10 million each, and we can go to Silicon Valley, and we can own it, because nobody is taking risk anymore. Let's take a billion dollars and go there, and let's just invest in all the good companies that need capital to take risk to do big things. Because nobody's doing it, we wouldn't have any competition. Kleiner Perkins wouldn't compete with us. Axel wouldn't compete with us. Nobody would. So a problem, in a way, is an opportunity if you look at it from the point of view of money. If you look at it from the point of view of the startup guys, it's a problem. From the point of view of money, it's an opportunity. If we fill that hole, it would help the incubators. Why? Because more of their companies would graduate and live instead of being acquired and going to work. It would help the entrepreneurs because they could actually execute bigger visions with longer term ideas. It would help growth capital because more companies would deserve growth capital. And it would help the human race because we'd all make progress by being able to build the things that need to be built. This is from two days ago, and it's a sign of hope. Just to finish on a high note, Index Ventures, which is based here in Europe, and Danny Reimer, who is one of the founders, raised a new fund, and the new fund is half a billion dollars. And um, he talked about the fact that what Index had been doing is growth investing. He said, you know, we invested in Dropbox, for example. It's now worth 10 billion, but when we invested, it was worth four. So we only returned our investors two and a half times their money. And, you know, if any of you know venture capital, that's an okay return, but it's not an outstanding return. He says at the bottom, the best opportunity to put our limited partners' money to work is to do more on the venture side than the growth side. Three cheers for Danny Reimer. That's exactly right. That's what needs to happen. I hope this is a leading indicator of that. I certainly am working towards that as well. Um, and just finally to say, um, I'm doing a new startup called Chat Center. It means um, it's possible to chat with a person just by knowing their name. Uh, you can chat with me at chatcenter.me slash Keith. It's a URL, so you can type it into a web browser, or you can download Chat Center yourself at chatcenter.me slash download. It's iOS only right now. Uh, and secondly, the presentation I just gave you is at this bit.ly URL. If you can take a picture of it or write it down and you want these slides, you can go and get these slides right here. Thank you. Thank you. Give me a big round of applause, please. Are we out of time? Or we no, you, you, you have plenty of time, actually. I want to... So this is a balloon, right? This is what you're supposed to do, guys. So I have a question here. It says, how can Keith go from being a tr Trotskyist to actually do TechCrunch 2T? So wh where is the... Are you still a political activist when you, uh, when you, do, when you help these entrepreneurs um, and startups? Actually, being a Trotskyist... Firstly, you have to understand a lot about the details of the history of... Marxism to answer the question. Yeah, yeah, and we haven't got time to do no, that. I know that. So it's a bit like saying what's the difference between a Catholic and a, uh, and a Presbyterian. Yeah, and a Protestant. You know, yeah. uh, 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 but it, basically, it, is, it, is it something... But, but do you feel that you still do activism yes, by actually achieving these yes, and helping these It's about these how do you change the world? Yeah. How do you en enable human beings to, raise, to realize their potential? And the thing about Trotsky was an internationalist. Sure. He, he hated Stalin. He hated the idea of Soviet Union, one country, uh, he hated it, and he was killed because of it. They killed him. Uh, he's an internationalist. Now, I'm British. I hate, I mean hate, British nationalism. 
I can't stand it. So you like the European Union? I, li I, I like Europeanism. I don't like, Sorry, I I don't like do bureaucracies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I like right. Europeanism. I, like, I don't like narrowness. I like broadness. And the internet is the most broadest thing of all. It's true. It's, it makes us all one. So for me, at least, the internet is the best global, no nation states, just people. It's fantastic. We're going to open the floor for a few questions, so please raise your hands. There's, here is this one woman with a microphone, so please raise your hands. Uh, there's one here. And he says, he says you're shy. I don't actually believe that, so... <laughs> uh, yeah, please. We have three or four questions, depending on the level. There's one uh, lady over there, but while, while I do that, I'm going to, when she gets ready, maybe you say there's a crunch, right? There's like this, this big opportunity. Is it also not because, I mean, all these uh, VC firms have moved towards the growth, uh, growth uh, 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 funding because, is it all not only because the asset class, I mean, I'm an investor, I have money. I'm not an investor, but I have money. If I had to choose where to put my money, actually, I, I, have, a, I, have, money. A, I have a startup and I need money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Should I, I mean, the returns are not that great. Let's be honest. Um, it depends. I'll, I'll give I you mean, I have to be an idealist, and that comes no, back to well, maybe so being an activist. Why would I put money in startups be besides if I love them? I think it really depends on how good the, the person who's investing your money is. I, I'm just going to tell my own story because I can't yeah. generalize. But two years ago, I started Archimedes Labs. Our first investment was a company called Quixie. Quixie does apps app search. So it does all of the search back end for app stores to find an app which actually solves a problem you have. Yep. So you can say, find me an app which translates English into Polish. And, and uh, it will that would find be very helpful for It me. will <laughs> find all the apps. Um, we were the first investor. Uh, la a few months ago, they got $50 million from Alibaba at a valuation of $200 million. We sold half of our shares. Nice. We made 25, 25 times X, yeah. our investment from selling just half of our position. We did a company called MDOT. MDOT was two guys from the Czech Republic. Um, they built an app called Webby, which built websites yeah. from iPhones. And we said, um, we don't think anyone needs websites anymore, but what if we built MDOT sites? Not websites, but mobile sites. And we changed the name of the company. Um, we gave a little bit of money, a small amount, $100,000. Within eight months, GoDaddy acquired them for 30 or 40 million, depending right. on, uh, GoDaddy is now doing an IPO, so we don't know exactly how yeah, much exactly, yet. Yeah. That was um, about 100 times our investment back. So if you do the right things, investing early can lead to very good outcomes. But venture capital has not delivered that, that's true. Yeah. And I'll that's because venture capital hasn't been taking risk. I'll go for the question, please go ahead. Say your name, please, so people Hi. can hear it. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Marta. Hi, Marta. Uh, thanks, Keith, for your presentation. Um, I can tell you we are shy, um, but we know how to go out of the comfort zone. So, yeah. And my question is, um, so you talked a lot about uh, growth capital, and uh, I wanted to ask, how do you envision the venture capital going forward if we have some signs that we should actually invest more on the venture capital side? I think it's a hard question to give a good answer to because I know. Um, it involves human beings making decisions different to the decisions they've been making. And we all know it's extremely hard to change behavior. So if I tell you that um, most of the people making investment decisions right now in Silicon Valley have an uh, analytical background, a metrics background. They may have been investment bankers, for example, or risk assessors. Uh, uh, they, they, they don't have intuition really anymore. They're not qualitative investors. They're quantitative investors. So they're looking for things they can measure. Well, those people are not going to build true venture capital. The, the, just the human capital that I is in those firms, they, they don't have the capability of moving from being quantitative to qualitative. And true venture capital is qualitative. You actually are investing before you know the outcome. And you have no measurable way of discovering the outcome. And there's only data about the past. There's no data about the future. Yes, yeah, you have a knowledge of the past. You have an intuition about the future. Yeah. You have some human beings who you either believe in or you don't. And you say, okay, is it likely these guys can make that happen? And a lot of it is intuition and experience. I'm old, so I have experience. Usually I can tell the difference between somebody who will definitely fail 
and somebody who might not fail, but you definitely can't choose the people who will win. You, you just don't know. So a lot of it is guesswork, and an analytical culture will never do guesswork. So, so what you really need is new people to raise funds from wealthy individuals and wealthy organizations, and to persuade those organizations that taking risk is good. Risk is good. I, I moved from the United Kingdom to USA in 1997 because in the UK I could not deliver the message risk is good and have anyone agree with me. It was impossible. So I moved to the US because at least there people believed risk is good. Now they don't even believe it there. So it needs a new generation. I, I, I'm, uh, I may look old, but trust me, in this world I'm very young. Uh, young in the sense that I have a lot of energy for the problem and I personally want to contribute to the solution. And I think people like Danny Reimer are doing the same. It just needs a new generation to rise up and say, no, this is wrong and we are got to do it this way. Another question? Thank you. Yes, here in front and one at the back. So please go first in front. Thank you. Hi, Keith. Uh, my name is Martin. Um, great presentation. Uh, the question that I want to ask is, there's a lot of talk about uh, building tech hubs outside of Silicon Valley. What's your take on that? Like, do people in Silicon Valley consider other cities, countries across the world as a potential uh, for sourcing? Or do they see them as just you know, something you know, being tried, but there's nothing really going on there? Yeah. Um, I think Silicon Valley is, is definitely elitist uh, in, in the sense that, and, and, it, and, and it is kind of a, an OK kind of elitism, because it is based on some truth. And the truth is that the conditions there to be successful um, uh, uh, exist on a greater scale than anywhere else. Just to give you some practical examples, a typical law firm in Silicon Valley will work for free for up to maybe $50,000 of billings and not expect to get paid if your company doesn't end up being funded. And so you can get resources, not for free, because if you're successful, you will end up paying, but no out-of-pocket upfront costs to get your company formed, your intellectual property registered, um, and so on and so forth. Engineers will moonlight. In other words, they'll keep their day job, and they'll work evenings and weekends on a side project, and they'll work for equity on, on the hope that it becomes something big and not need to be paid. So, and, and, you know, there is super angels and micro funds. A micro fund is typically a fund of under $100 million. In Silicon Valley, there's 135 micro funds right now. So that's a lot of money available for the early stage, for the pre-traction stage, if you like. So you can experiment there and, and get the cash needed to experiment. As long as you don't spend it all on pay paying salaries and lawyers, it will last quite a long time. Um, so Silicon Valley has conditions for success that aren't everywhere. What it does not have is a monopoly of talent. You just have to look around the world at the things which have arisen everywhere else to understand that Silicon Valley has no monopoly of talent. So it's entirely possible for anywhere, literally anywhere in the world, to come up with an idea, to execute the idea, and to be a global player in the idea, because the world is very small now, as long as you start with the mindset that that's possible. If you think too, too small and too locally, then of course you will mainly build small companies that are mainly applicable to local markets, but there's no need for that to be true. W what's missing is capital. But I will argue, based on what you, I've just told you, that Silicon Valley used to have an advantage there, it has less and less of an advantage because you can probably raise $100,000 here for a, for a good team and a good startup idea, the same as you could in the Valley. And you probably will fail to get the big money unless you get traction, just as you will fail in the Valley. So in fact, aside from the infrastructure in the Valley, and that is more applicable later when you want to be acquired or do an IPO, aside from that, I think the world's becoming very similar. And so I do not believe, when people say you have to move to Silicon Valley, even though I did do that, I actually don't think that's as true today as it was when I did. So you would say that you wouldn't have to move to Silicon Valley to achieve success today? If you, if you uh, had all the ecosystem supporting you in your local market, 
if you had that, I don't think you will need to. But having said that, I'm still cynical of London. So uh, <laughs> what can I tell you? But I look here, you know, this is a great gathering. This is a great facility. Um, I've met people who are doing incubators here. There's great engineering talent here. I think that needs to be complemented by marketing, positioning, go-to-market talent. But most of the conditions, minus the capital, are here. The missing one is the capital, and that there's plenty of rich people here. They just need to be persuaded that Convinced. taking risk in early stage tech is a good idea. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not going to allow any more questions because we are running out of time. But will you be sticking around? I'm here all the way till Saturday. By the way, I, if any of you are soccer fans, I am. Uh, I, I must supporting? say, who are you supporting? Uh, you know, the only, the only thing that I become nationalistic about is soccer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would tell my friends, I supported Argentina in the war against England for the Malvinas. I Falklands, was, it's called the Falklands. Las Sorry. Malvinas, please. <laughs> um, but when Argentina play England at soccer, I will never support Argentina. <laughs> war, yes, soccer, so never. That, the first game is on Saturday night for, versus Italy. So right? I'll be back yeah. in London then, but I'm here tonight yeah, and I'm too. here tomorrow. London for two watch that. So thank you, Keith. Please applaud him.